and, and, and welcome to a special AARP Coffee and Conversation. I am one of your co-hosts. Uh, my name is Mark Boyd, and I'm extremely fortunate to be the volunteer state president of AARP New Hampshire. Co-hosting with me this morning is Linda Hodgson, also an AARP volunteer. Now, please note, as you probably figured that out about 30 seconds ago, we are recording today's session. And as you know, before we start anything with AARP, I have to cover a few housekeeping items. In an effort to eliminate background noises, please be sure to mute your line by ensuring your microphone icon has a line through it. We'd love to hear from you this morning, so if you would like to ask a question, please use the chat box, which can be accessed by clicking the chat button. Our Associate State Director of Communications, Pam Doobie, Pam, I, no, she, she, she is with us, uh, and our Senior Operation Associate, Cheryl Sweet. Cheryl, can you please wave at us? Uh, it's our senior operations associate will take turns monitoring the chat room and raising your questions throughout the program. So please, I'm begging you, keep them busy or else they will get in trouble. Here at AARP New Hampshire, we are focused on the health, financial security, and social connections critical to the well being of the 50 plus in the Granite State. We carry out our work through targeted advocacy at the state and federal levels, compelling engagement of the 50 plus community statewide, and also serving as a trusted resource for information for our members and the public. So hopefully you have your coffee at hand. Sean, I know you have a coffee, right? You're a Panera. No coffee? I'm the only one... In Oh, the only one in this group would, oh, thank you, thank you. Anyways, uh, I'm so happy to announce joining our conversation this morning is James McKim. James is the president of the Manchester branch of the NAACP. James serves as managing partner of organizational ignition. He is driven by an intense need to help organizations achieve their peak performance through the alignment of people, businesses, processes, and technology. He is recognized as a thought leader in organizational performance, the use of neuroscience, and program management. James has led or held leadership positions in organizations such as Hewitt Packard Enterprise, FIRST, F-I-R-S-T, Hawkeye Data, LLC, and Digital Equipment Corporation to deliver award-winning product launch and performance enhancement solutions that increased company efficiency and revenues. James has also played an active role in the shaping of public policy, affecting the manufacturing healthcare, and technology industries, having served on several boards, including the Software Association of New Hampshire, the New Hampshire Tech Alliance, New Hampshire PBS, Economic Vitality, New Hampshire, and the Manchester NAACP. Welcome, James, and thanks for joining us this morning. Let's jump right in with the first question from our co-host this morning, AARP volunteer, Linda Hodgson. Thank you so much. So welcome. Um, I'd like to start with the basics. For those not familiar, could you please tell us about the Manchester branch of the NAACP, the work that it strives to do, and how that work is carried out? Jim, well, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Linda, and thank you, Mark, and thank you so much for inviting me to join uh, this little gathering today. So the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, that's what NAACP stands for, um, has the mission of securing the political, educational, social, and economic equality of rights in order to eliminate race based discrimination and ensure the health and well being of all persons. So that's, that's our overall mission. And the New Hampshire branch has the responsibility for 
carrying forth that mission in the greater Manchester area. So Manchester and the surrounding towns. And to that end, um, we have several programs in place that uh, deal with economic justice, environmental and climate justice, health justice, criminal justice, and uh, education justice. And those uh, areas each have committees that focus in on uh, those areas and the programs that, uh, that they, um, they execute on. So we're really, really focused on the being an advocate for the needs of people of color in the area. Um, and what I try to bring to the table is my organizational experience in supporting the work of our volunteers. We're an all volunteer organization, uh, some branches, uh, and there are over 6,000 branches across the country. Some branches are big enough that they actually have paid staff. We are not so big or fortunate. So we're all, we're all volunteer staff, just like the ARP is uh, mostly volunteer. Um, and so my job is to uh, figure out how we can support uh, that work that all of our volunteers uh, are doing to achieve that mission and partnering with organizations like the AARP uh, so that we can uh, fulfill that mission in a way that is inclusive rather than saying we're the only ones who can uh, perform that mission and do, and do this work. Thank you. With that, I'm going to turn the next question over to Mark. And yes, we have formed AARP New Hampshire has formed an alliance with the NAACP Manchester branch too that we are so excited uh, to kick off. James, from what I understand, your service with the NAACP is focused on helping to diversify New Hampshire and develop the state into being a more welcoming place for minorities. Can you please tell us about your role in this in a bit more detail and how's it working out? Well, well great question. So um, let me start with saying that, that uh, in New Hampshire, there are three NAACP branches. There's the branch which I lead in, in the greater Manchester area, there is a branch in uh, the greater Nashua area and a branch in the seacoast area. So the three branches together uh, work to address issues of discrimination across the state. Um, uh, while individually we work to address issues of discrimination and equal rights in our uh, local geographies. So, uh, from a statewide level, uh, Mark in his introduction mentioned the Economic Vitality New Hampshire initiative, which I uh, helped to, to lead. And that, that's a statewide issue, which is in fact trying to look at how we uh, make New Hampshire overall a more welcoming state for uh, people of color. And so the mission is not really to make New Hampshire a more diverse state, it's happening. If you look at the demographics of the census, uh, you'll see that we went from being 90% white to 86% white in this last census. So, the, and, and this is really in terms of uh, people of color, right? The, the trend is already happening that way. So we're not trying to drive that. We're just trying to create an environment where people want to come and to stay, right? We have people of color who are coming into the state who have come into the state and have left because it's not as welcoming as a state. And when we say welcoming state, we, what we mean is um, from a, a, a relationship perspective uh, and an interaction perspective, uh, we have a number of hate groups, for example, and we are actually, <laughs> some, some would say a poster child for hate groups in the nation. Uh, the Proud Boys are a major force uh, here in the state in terms of hate crimes groups. They, and uh, 
they 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 have membership all across the nation, but um, they're they're really kind of headquartered here. So with that, between that and the fact that uh, we are, as many other places around the country are, white normative, and I use that term uh, to to articulate that um, our society is built around white people. And if you want examples of that, um, and this is not just New Hampshire, but it, particularly in New Hampshire, when you go into a hotel room and you go into the bathroom, you expect to find what? Shampoo, body lotion, right? So did you ever stop to think for who was that shampoo designed? Whose hair will that work on? Will that work on hair of people of color, curly like mine? Well, kind of, but not really. It wasn't designed for that. So think of all the products and services that we, we have here in the state. For whom were they designed? Probably not for people of color. Doesn't mean that people of color can't use them, but they weren't designed for people of color. And specifically getting services, finding a place to get a haircut, right? If you can't find the services that you need, then why live in a place like that? So what, what we're trying to accomplish through Economic Vitality in New Hampshire is to make people aware of the needs of people of color and of, of diverse people overall. Um, when, we, when we use the term diversity, we're not just talking about people of color. We're also talking about women. We're talking about people with disabilities. We're talking about people who think differently. Right? So we're trying to, to raise awareness of what diversity really is and the value of diversity, that broader definition of diversity. Uh, we've really just started off in this this, uh, this effort, it's been over the last few years, the last three years or so that we've really kicked off the effort. Uh, one of the results is we've just launched uh, an organization called um, the Business Alliance for People of Color, which is a group of, I guess we're up to about 47 now businesses that are owned by people of color. And we have some funding from Citizens Bank uh, to build out a minority-owned business list, which resides on our website, on the, the Manchester NAACP website at the moment. Uh, there were 137 businesses on that list last Saturday when I last checked it. So we're looking to promote businesses of color, uh, as well as to be able to share information with them that will help them to be successful in their own businesses and their wealth creation as well. Um, and the NAACP, uh, the three branches are, are playing a role in that more from a uh, interpersonal perspective than from an organizational perspective. So the whole effort uh, of the economic vitality in New Hampshire blends in with what the NAACP's mission is uh, from the interpersonal perspective. Um, so, I, so that along with the work of our various committees and each of the three branches has uh, a, a, an effort focused in those areas. We're all structured a little bit differently, uh, but looking at education in the Manchester area, we know it, that in 2014, uh, the Department of uh, Education's Justice um, Department filed a suit against the Manchester School District because it was being discriminatory against people of color. And the school district had to create a plan for addressing that discrimination. Well, we're in 2021 and almost none of the things that the school district said it was going to do have been done. So we just formed a committee, a special committee, a subcommittee of our education committee that is now working with a subcommittee of the, the board of school committee in Manchester to try to make sure that those, those uh, things get done. So that's the, the kind of work that we do in the education space. In the uh, criminal justice space, uh, we have 
our uh, what we call a legal redress uh, reporting mechanism, where anyone can report discrimination of any kind that has happened to them, and we will look into that uh, reported discrimination. Um, and we we've gotten 44 reports of discrimination so far this year, 45 actually just just got received another one uh, yesterday I saw, and we reach out to every single one of those folks who. Uh, reported discrimination, and we get to know what their situation is, and we determine whether there's legal help that we can uh, point them to, or whether we need to come out and make a statement that uh, raises awareness that this discrimination is happening and puts pressure on whoever it is that's in, in authority in that situation to make amends for that. And that goes along with uh, making sure we're creating this welcoming environment for everyone. Thank you, James. So we have the three branches are Nashua, Seacoast, and Manchester of yeah. the NAACP. Well, what is your membership? How many members do you have in the Manchester branch? In Manchester, we have 141 members. And membership, by the way, is not just people of color. In fact, each of the three branches is predominantly white people. Wow. So we have 171. I'm not sure what the other branches are at in terms of membership uh, today. Last I heard from Nashua, uh, there were, I think, in the range of uh, 100 or so people. Uh, Seacoast, uh, which Seacoast is actually our oldest branch, formed in 1958. And uh, last I heard, they had membership of around 150 or so people. Oh, thank you. Okay, now it's your opportunity. We're gonna run into the chat room and what questions do we have or statements? Oh, we have a, a few in the chat um, for James. Um, the first one is, and it seems like you've covered this, but maybe there are some more. What are some examples of changes that have been made in New Hampshire specifically that have been successful? Um, other changes. So um, uh, some of you are aware that uh, I served on the Governor's Commission on Law Enforcement Accountability, Community and Transparency last summer. And out of that, uh, uh, I served on that commission as well as Rogers Johnson, who was president of the Seacoast branch. Um, and there, there were uh, 48 recommendations that came out of that effort, uh, many of which have been implemented around uh, ensuring that there's training for law enforcement around implicit bias uh, and discrimination, um, uh, around raising awareness um, of law enforcement overall, um, about um, policies that uh, lead people of color to be distrustful of police. Um, we actually uh, crafted uh, Senate Bill 96 to implement some of those recommendations, which passed and the governor signed it. Um, so a number of things from the legislative perspective. Um, we received a grant from the Harvard Pilgrim Tufts Foundation of $10,000 to work on uh, ensuring that people of color had access to vaccines uh, and had uh, places, trusted places where they could go to actually receive those vaccines and to help um, um, eliminate the misinformation or fight the misinformation that was going on around receiving the vaccine. So we had, I believe we've had five vaccination clinics that we've worked with uh, the city of Manchester on. Uh, and I think the number of vaccinations that I heard was we've gotten, uh, I think it was around 70 people vaccinated through those clinics. So a couple more examples of, of things that have been done that have been successful, some changes that have been made. Um, and not that we're, not that we're, we're, we're done yet, we had some uh, interesting legislation passed in HB2 and the, the divisive concepts language that was uh, implemented that we're working on. I'm, I'm working with a number of the, uh, the 
um, House uh, Democratic leaders to uh, put forth some legislation that will help make that a little um, a little less uh, chilling for teachers and others to really talk about the subject of discrimination and racism. Um, I've had meetings with uh, the Attorney General and uh, with uh, um, Director Ani Malakai from the Human uh, Rights Commission. And I think what's come out of that that's been good is uh, some of you may have seen the guidance that uh, was produced on uh, implementation and um, um, interpretation of the divisive concepts language. And I, I think what was really heartening to me is that the guidance actually came out and said, we need to have these conversations about race, about discrimination. And the point is, uh, we don't want those conversations to devolve into finger pointing and to uh, getting across the message that any one race is any better than the other. And that's exactly the message we want to get across. We're not talking about one race being any better than the other. We're not talking about white people being inherently bad, but we do need to talk about the fact that there are disparities in healthcare, the disparities in civil and criminal justice, disparities in education. And we need to address those because they're negatively impacting everyone, not just people of color, but everyone. So hopefully yeah. that gives a little more to, to that, to round yes, that. Absolutely. And we have <clears throat> several questions popping in. So, um, you know, I know that you uh, that we at ARP are really excited to be um, developing this partnership with you. And obviously this event is, is one of the ways that we can do that. And I'm wondering how you envision other ways that AARP can collaborate with the NAACP. I know we have a, a small group here today, but after this, we are gonna be posting this on our um, Facebook page where we have over 13,000 members who are gonna be listening to this. So what is your message for our population, which is pretty much 50 plus, but obviously these topics are, are relevant for all ages. Right. So what, what I would suggest, and I saw in the chat, you posted the, the Manchester Branches uh, website. Um, I would suggest going to the branch, uh, the website of the branch that's closest to you and I'm, I'm looking and seeing what that branch is doing. Um, and see how you can get involved um, in the various areas. And I, I mentioned education, um, climate and environmental justice, healthcare, uh, criminal justice. There's just so many places where you could get involved. Um, I, I'd also suggest, you know, just being aware of what's going on. And um, the, the phrase that we use is calling in discrimination when you see it. Uh, some people use the phrase calling, call out discrimination, call out someone when they, when they uh, are saying something that's wrong or doing something that's wrong. Um, I like to use the phrase calling in because calling out is being very judgmental and it will put someone on, on the defensive, but calling them in is all about um, making them aware that something that they said or did didn't quite sit well with you. And uh, draw them into a conversation as to why they did what they did or said what they said in an inquisitive way. Uh, Doug Stone and Sheila uh, uh, Heen and uh, Bruce Patton wrote a great book called uh, Difficult Conversations where they talk about how to have productive, difficult conversations. And their guidance is to shift to a learning stance, seek to understand that person and why they said or did what they did. Don't be judgmental, just ask them. And sometimes just asking somebody, uh, what did you just say? Just get them to repeat it. That makes them think about what they said because they may not have thought about what they said. They may have just said what was on their mind at the moment without any forethought. Okay. So all in all, there, there are techniques that, that we, we talk about. Uh, we talk about in our various meetings. Uh, so education, if you want to get educated on how to address some of these issues, come to our meetings. 
Uh, we also work with a number of organizations. If I switch hats, my, my own company, we actually have a series of workshops on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so it, education, 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 education is really what we're pushing for and advocacy. Um, so when there are um, advocacy events, we have uh, marches at the state house. We had marches at the various uh, city halls around the, the state. Um, find out when those are, come out, support the, the, the efforts that are going on. Uh, I think those are some, some great ways that, that uh, we can get uh, folks more involved. James, thank you. And I just want to remind everyone, we are going back to the chat room before we leave. So if you have a question, please jump in the chat room. And with that, Linda, you have a question. I do, thank you so much. Um, James, can you, um, what can today's listeners do to foster a more inclusive New Hampshire and support diversity, equity, and inclusion every day? And I think you've covered on some of that. Is there anything more you'd like to elaborate on? So what I would say there is a um, couple of things. One, um, look at your city or town ordinances. Look at them with what we call an equity lens. And we, I, I like to make the distinction between equality and equity. You know, we talk about wanting to be in a society where everyone is treated equally, right? Well, on the face of it, that might sound good until we realize that People are not all at the same starting place. People of color particularly have disadvantages. People with disabilities have disadvantages. Women have disadvantages, right? So to say we want to treat people equally doesn't quite cut it. We need to treat people equitably. So thinking about what that difference is between equality and equity, I think is important. And then looking at, uh, in our communities, where there are barriers to success, where there are laws or um, regulations that are discriminatory. And when you see those, call your representatives. Let them know that you see this thing that looks inequitable, that they should do something about. And that's, that's city level, state level, federal level, wherever you may have uh, an interest. And we also talk about you know, the sphere of influence. Think about what is your sphere of influence? What is your sphere of control and your sphere of influence? Right? So where can you examine culture? Desmond Menachem, uh, um, author of My Grandmother's Hands calls culture, how our bodies reenact history through the foods we eat the stories we tell, the images that hold meaning for us. So we can look at our culture, look at how we live and ask, is it equitable? Does it promote equity? Or does it prevent some people from enjoying life, having the things that they need? Um, so those are some, I think, some suggestions I would give uh, for promoting equity uh, throughout our state and creating a more welcome society. For everybody. Thank you very much. I just took lots of notes. <laughs> and with Mark, I'll turn that over to you for the next question. Hey, James, this is your grand finale. <gasps> so hopefully you're ready. I'm ready. Drum roll, please. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, and, and, and you've already hit upon some of these uh, questions, but maybe you can expound a little more. How can people support or actually get involved with the Manchester or the Seacoast or Nashville's branch of the NAACP? And what events do you have coming up? Yeah, so as, as I mentioned, go to the website. Um, each branch actually has a general member meeting once a month. So you can see when those meetings are and attend them. And the uh, at those meetings, you'll generally hear a report on what the branch has been up to and what the branch is planning on doing. Um, we just, the, the Manchester branch, uh, just participated in the uh, Manchester uh, School District uh, School Celebration that happened on the 18th. Um, we participated in the, um, 
the We Are One Festival that happened over uh, in late August. Uh, last Saturday, we had our Freedom Fund Dinner. Uh, the Freedom Fund Dinner um, is for each branch, its largest fundraising effort for the year. And it generally uh, provides the funds for the organization to operate throughout the year. So uh, on an annual basis, uh, you can attend the Freedom Fund Dinner and see what's going on and, and uh, contribute that way. Uh, as I said, each branch has its own Freedom Fund Dinner uh, that happens at a different time. Ours happens usually in the fall. Uh, the Seacoast happens in the spring. Uh, Nashua's, I'm not, uh, Nashua's usually happens in the springtime as well. Um, so certainly uh, go to the websites, get involved in those meetings, and then see when various subcommittees have meetings. Uh, for our branch, our subcommittees uh, have also meetings once a, once a month where they talk about the programs and the status of those programs that they're undertaking. So that, that's how I suggest getting involved. So James, is there any question that you really wanted to answer that we did not ask you? Uh, any question that I didn't get to answer? I think I got to answer just about everything. Oh, no, I that you would like us to ask you. Is there a oh. question you wanted us to ask you that we completely missed? One, one question that comes to mind um, for me is, you know, how, how can there be a sustained effort around the question of reparations? Uh, reparations has come up in the um, in Congress, been in Washington for several years, HB 40 has come up a number of times. And um, a number of states are now bringing it to the state level, bringing that issue to the state level and asking, what can we do as a state uh, around reparations? And um, I, I want to dispel the notion that reparations is only about money. I actually do a, a, an hour workshop on what is reparations. Reparations about, is about repair of dignity and relationships. That's really what it's about. And monetary uh, recompense is one, uh, one way to accomplish that because we know, for example, uh, the Pew uh, Institute says that uh, white families wealth is the Pew Charitable Foundation says 13 times the wealth of African-American families. 13 times, right? So we have huge disparities that we need to address. So financial is one, but opportunity and access are an, another piece to that puzzle of how we reconcile our relationships. So uh, I think asking more about reparations, learning more about reparations, I'm actually working on pulling together a reparations conference or planning a planning team put on a reparations conference so we can figure out what do we do in New Hampshire? Because there are injuries that have happened that are specific to New Hampshire that the federal government's not gonna be able to address. So what do we do in New Hampshire? Um, so that's, that's, I think the only, the only topic that we didn't really talk about that I'd, uh, I'd mentioned here uh, and, and, and ask folks to, to think about. James, thank you. I'm going to turn this over to Linda now to wrap everything up. I'm going to interrupt for just a moment. We do have a couple of questions in chat. So one of them that I was going to get to, James, is how do parent groups fight against misinformation by other parents on the star argument of CRT in efforts to ban diverse books and curriculum in libraries? Excellent question. No. Uh, I, I, I'm in so many discussions about this very topic. In fact, I'm leading a, a panel of chief diversity officers at uh, Franklin Pierce University next week to talk about this very question at the um, academic uh, secondary school level. Um, I, there are some articles that we can point you to that explain what CRT really is, first of all. Uh, because I, I think, and I, I'm a philosophy major, so I was taught first define what something is <laughs> before you get into an argument about it. <laughs> so um, first understand what it is, and then um, 
and understanding what it is, um, what I'll say is that so many school districts are getting pushback on this and having to respond to it. Um, there is no school district that is teaching that one race is any better than the other. And that's what the, those folks who are misinterpreting CRT are really trying to say, that the theory is being used to teach that one race is better than another and that, that white people are bad. And that's not what CRT is saying at all. Right? CRT is saying that race is, has an impact. There is, uh, there are disparities that are due solely to race. That's what CRT is really about. The theory is that and it, it's the critical piece. It's not critical being uh, saying that it's bad. It's critical in the sense that we're really examining this. We're examining this from a data-driven perspective. That's the, the criticality of that. So I'd say learn about what CRT really is, and then you can have the, uh, have the discussions around uh, from the school district's perspective. And I, I, I'm working very closely with uh, Tina Philibot, the new chief equity officer uh, for Manchester. And I had a great conversation with uh, Brian Hawkins from the NEA. And so there's guidance being put out about how to address this very topic from the school's perspective. Uh, and so that'll be coming out and um, you can look at that. And, and, and also just look at the guidance that came out from the attorney general, from uh, Commissioner Edelblue and from Ani Malachi that's published, uh, I believe it's on the attorney general's website, that guidance around the divisive concepts language uh, in the law, that will give you some ammunition for addressing CRT as well, because CRT is not mentioned in the law at all, at all. Even though people are saying it, it is. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of uh, ammunition for addressing that, that issue. Linda did, you, Linda, did you want to bring up your question? I also happen to agree with it. The news on Proud Boys being very disturbing. Yeah, it is very disturbing. And, and um, you think about writing letters to the editor and you think about attending marches and you have other suggestions on how to push back. I mean, that's so disturbing for such a small state as New Hampshire to have that kind of a presence here. Um, scary. I'm just I'm just actually responding to a question from that got sent directly to me. So, okay. Um, well, but I, so I'm I'm finished with that. So, uh, what else? So, so the news on the Pow Proud Boys is very disturbing. What do you suggest to best push back? Uh, letters to the editor and speaking out are certainly some obvious choices. What else can we do? Um, we're such a small state at 1.3 million population to have that kind of a presence here. Right. Um, so I, I guess I'll go back to the, the rallies that take place. You know, the rallies are where the Proud Boys and where those other hate groups uh, try to flex their muscle. And so um, what we want is there to be more people who are pushing for the issue than the hate groups who are pushing against the issue. So that's, that's one way. Um, I'd say, and and certainly writing the the articles, um, the those folks are very organized, I'll say, uh, and adept at writing uh, pieces that um, get the attention of the masses. So we need to have as many people writing articles that are really speaking truth to power, as it were, uh, but truth uh, as those who are. Uh, spreading misinformation and falsehoods and fear. Uh, there, there is this, this fear that, that these folks have of what we call a zero sum game. And that's a fear that if people of color get anything, that's gonna take away from them. And that's living in a, a, a sense of scarcity rather than a sense of abundance. We have an abundance here. 
Mm -hmm. And it's not a zero sum game. Making sure that the people of color and those who are um, underrepresented have what they need to survive does not mean we're taking away from those who feel they have some kind of privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, would you like me to wrap up? Cheryl, is there anything else in the chat room that you'd like to bring up or? We have addressed all questions in the chat room. Uh, thank you. Linda. All right. Well, thank you so much, um, James, for sharing your time and expertise with all of us today. I certainly found it helpful and learned so much. Um, thanks to the audience for joining us for today's coffee and conversation. Oops, sorry, that's my dog. Including the dog. <laughs> Who let the dogs in? That's my Sheltie. Tucker, Tucker, quiet. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Mr. McKim and that the information and resources will be of value to you. And be sure to check the AARP New Hampshire website often. AARP.org slash New Hampshire. Tucker, stop. For more virtual programs coming soon, including live cooking demonstrations, paint and sip events, gentle yoga, and yes, more coffee and conversations. Be well and take care. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. This is the culprit. <laughs>